It's Ebro in the morning. Laura Styles is complaining. Rosenberg is being lazy, <laughs> and we have Eddie Huang. What up? Fresh off the boat in the building. Hey. All right, so let's get right into it. I love the program. Thank you, fam. But the first thing I heard um, was that you didn't. Yeah, fresh off the boat. Yeah. Yeah, no. When it first came out, I felt like it was a very incomplete view, a little inaccurate. You know, like, they'll reference, they'll tell jokes about, like, how my parents listen to the Allman Brothers, and I'm like, stop at five. Like, my dad, every Saturday morning, was singing the Bee Gees on karaoke. I was so like, get the bands right. <laughs> yeah. Get the bands right. Right. You know? So, was was it, were you upset that it wasn't correct to your story, or you thought it was something else in there that should have been portrayed? You know, my thing is, is that it's all right if it wasn't correct to my story, but the thing for me was that every time we tell them or we give them the book and there's examples of things that actually happened in an Asian home— they would just twist it a little bit. They'd filter it a little bit and suture it. In what it. way? Uh, like they change the references. Like if the if the hip hop reference was Outkast, Duck Down Records, yada yada, it'd become the Beastie Boys. You know, like uh, in the first season they shot the Beastie Boys. I got. I remember Juha and Noha sent me like the Duck Down shirts. Wu sent me some shirts, and then like I had the Mob Deep joints, and they were like, nobody knows Mob Deep. We're not gonna put this on the kid. And I was like, fam, that's so they that's didn't feel the like life. they didn't feel like your life was actually mainstream enough. Is yeah, their point? Yeah, and also certain elements of hip hop, like the kid, the first season just keeps wearing Biggie and Nas shirts. Right. And yeah. I'm like, this is like Applebee's acceptable hip hop. Right. You know, and that's the most fire. Big is the god, number one, yeah. all time. But you know, I just feel like this show is a jumping off point for immigrants from around the world and hip hop. Like you know, we just been down for it since day one with the restaurant, the books. Yeah. So I want it to be like 360. I don't want it to just be like the taster's choice. So let me ask you this, and, and for everybody <sighs> tuning in, watching right now, Fresh Off the Boat is on ABC. Yeah, and so, I fuck with the show. Oh, sorry, my bad. No, but, you like good. I really, you I love guys. the show. Yeah, the thing is, is that. Um, I I don't watch the show because I don't think it's healthy to watch like a twelve year old kid play your life out. That's just a weird dynamic to have. But I mean, those <laughs> kids those kids work hard. I love those kids. Yeah, Constant Wu that plays my mom. She's excellent. Yo, I love and, her. Yeah, she's yeah. the baddest. So I got a crush on her. Yeah, she's the baddest. Okay. She's the baddest. No, Constance is kind of hot to me. I'm <laughs> yeah, she's a problem. Constance no. is a problem. Real talk. <laughs> you know. But uh, the thing with the show is is that uh. You know, a lot of Asians and a lot of immigrants around the world, they relate to it. So my thing is, once I saw people in the neighborhood relating to it, I was like, I'm not going to take this away from nobody. I'm going to stop hitting oh, them. Oh, so you, let them you were going to go hard. Like, yo, I don't condone this and I want it gone. You yeah, were going to go that hard. I did. I wrote like a big article in New York Magazine talking about, you know, the things that I thought they should do. I was like, this feels like a bit of a Panda Express orange chicken oof, version of our oof, lives. Oof. But then what I realized is that is how a lot of people come to our culture. That is a gateway. And like when you are a person of color in this country, your story, if you're trying to tell it, it's going to get fragmented. And you have to tell it over and over so that these cats will listen to you and even let you in the building. You know? Wow. So That's this was a big one to get on base. Um, mm. Was there any point in your mind too where you had to stop and go, I mean, it is Disney. It is ABC. So I know there's going to be... Yeah, that was the part that I think I was hard-headed. I know I was hard-headed about. Right. And I, I wouldn't accept it. I was like, just because you're ABC, just because you're Disney, and you think that we need to tell universal white stories with yellow faces, I was like, I don't believe that. I think white people want to know what's really good. Like, right. the, the general masses, not just white people. But they, people. Want a, they want an authentic. Yeah, people this generation, they want the real. Well, so and I was you like, know that just from give being a hip-hop fan, too. That's, a, that's something that us that live in this hip-hop thing, we understand is that the realer it is, the more honest it is. The farther it goes, because it's organic, it's honest, it, it is what it is. I mean, yeah. that's one of the reasons I fell in love with the show. I told, I remember there was an episode where he's like making a mixtape for his girl, and he put like "Summertime in the LBC." <laughs> that specific, yo, I was crying. I thought it was the best shit ever. I was like, "This is it," and the Janet yeah. Jackson episode. Yeah. But then now that you tell me, like now all of it, it's twisted up. It makes me feel different now. You know. So, what I mean? what's the book? Your book, the show's already based on. That's yeah, been the, out. the book that I wrote, the first book, is fresh off the boat, mm -hmm. and that's what the show's based on. And just so the record is clear. I, I, I fuck with the show. Okay. I support it because, you know what, it's doing a lot for the community. Right. So I'm never going to get in the way of, like, positive movement for the community. And then I wrote this second book because the first book's all about my family coming to America, creating our America, and creating our place here. Because America didn't just, like, open their arms, you know? Like, we had to make, make it happen. Talk the, about the it. The second book is Double Cup Love, and that's about me going back to China with my brothers on some like belly back to the motherland shit yeah. to be like, are we actually Chinese? Like how will China receive us? And 
it's a really interesting story. It's it's the bookend, and I feel like it completes like this journey of identity that every kid born into the diaspora has to experience. It's a, I thought it was a love story too. It's a love. Oh, okay. absolutely, it's a love story. Because right. you know what? I think the thing that is the most defining and separates cultures is like how we love, like the values. You know what I mean? Like the way people do marriages and. Indian culture or Puerto right. Rican culture or Chinese culture, Hasidic Jewish culture. And when I brought my shorty back to China, she got my to see shorty. how And she's we not moved. Chinese. No, she was Irish Italian from Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so in the book, I talk about like watching like Pretty Woman or Mystic Pizza as a kid. And yeah. I'm like, yo, them sharp-nosed white women got me popping. <laughs> So I found I found myself one and brought it back to China. Yo, facts. Yeah. So um so in the in the show, yo, it's so amazing. In the show, um the the experience that the kid has just like dating, mixing at school, like even opening like at lunch, opening up food yeah. and other kids making That's fun the of the episode smell of the I love. Mm-hmm. The pilot episode is my favorite. Yeah. Cause that one we really stuck to like a real experience. Okay. The, the thing when I was in third grade. There was another student that pushed me on the ground and called me a chink. It was the first time anyone called me a chink to my face. And what, how old were you? I was in third grade, so I think like eight or nine, mm-hmm. something like that. I think that's the age when, when you're at, when you're around third grade. But my pops had told me, he's like, anybody says this to you, you're fighting. You know what I mean? Like, you're fighting. There's no question about it. You're going to go in. And I didn't even want to fight, but I was like, he did this to me. My dad told me I got to fight. And that's the thing my dad really instilled in me that I think a lot of other... Asian kids in America, their, their parents weren't telling them, like, stand up and fight. A lot of the Asian cats I knew, they just keep it moving. Walk, turn the other cheek, mm. look down at your shoes. And I I got I got on my horse and I got busy. And so my whole life, that's I learned to fight, you know? So that's that's what I think the first book is about. And what was the what was the moment? I know you show it a little bit in the show, but the first time you heard that hip hop record, I think it was the pilot episode when your dad was like, you know. You guys were at the, I think you had a furniture store in D.C. Yeah, yeah, goes, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. yeah. And then Pops was like working for your mom's father. Mm-hmm. And the father was looking at him like, you loser, you married my daughter, you have nothing to offer. So you guys yeah. bounce and you move to Orlando, right? Yeah. And he opens up the little buffet. Cattleman's yep, yep, yep. Cattleman's or whatever. Yeah, looking yeah. like a Golden Corral. Golden yeah, Corral. Yeah. <laughs> a chase. Yeah. Right? Um, but there was a moment in there where the kid discovers rap. Yeah. You know, Is I that a didn't, real moment? I didn't watch that episode. I don't know that episode. But in my real life, what happened was it started with Michael. Like, I loved Michael as a kid. Like, Michael Jackson, bad, all that, thriller. And then it moved to, I remember when uh, Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff came out with Nightmare on, on My Street. And there was Elm Street. And in D.C., there was Elm Street. You mm. drive by Elm Street all the time. And I was like, yo, that's our block. And I didn't know anything. It's definitely not our block, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yo, they're talking about Elm Street. And I remember, like, that was one of the first tapes I got was Nightmare on My Street. And then Hilarious. I just got, I got way into it. I remember when Onyx dropped. That was a big deal. Yeah. Onyx, mm-hmm. um, you know, Doggy Style Chronic, all the, all the obvious ones. But early on, that's what I was listening to. And then it blew it open. This, this kid driving me to school, this other uh, Indian kid in the neighborhood, we would carpool together. And he was like three years older than me. So he had a driver's license. He put in 36 chambers. Mm-hmm. And that was it. That was it, you know? I remember that's when I was like, I'm never, never leaving this. You know, like they fuck with Kung Fu, they fuck with us. I was like, I saw a lot of parallels (laughs) and synergies. Yeah. And because as as an Asian in America, you never saw people fuck with our culture. It was always jokes. Like y'all are dog eaters, rat eaters, cat eaters. And so when I saw and listened to the Wu, like embracing our culture and talking about things like the I Ching and Kung Fu that, and I knew all the movies, I was like, this is my shit. And what do you think that's universal with most people who love Wu-Tang that are Asian as well? Uh, I can't speak for other people, but I definitely know from me and my friends, there was a real sense of pride and it felt like your culture was being co-signed by people you respected. So what, the Wu was huge for Asian people. And obviously. when and, and this only just for ignorance, right? Because obviously, you know, growing up, my mother's Jewish, my father's black. So mm-hmm. uh, you're embraced by black people, but you're never black. Mm-hmm. Enough. Yeah. Right? yeah and then yeah. white people, you're just never white. But yeah. having yeah. a real talk with you of somebody who grew up in this hip hop thing, you've yeah. owned a streetwear brand, but you've also owned uh, cuisine, like restaurants, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Cultural cuisine. Yeah. Right? Now you've written a book. Now you uh, have been a part of a TV show. You're part of another book. Yeah. And we'll get into where people could come meet you and, and all that. 
Can you articulate for immigrants, first generation here in this country, yeah. what is it about hip hop culture that, that pulls in uh, immigrants and people who just get to this? Yeah, the thing is, is, in America, if you were born in the 80s, growing up in the 90s, it, you only saw either white people or black people on television. And I remember a defining moment for me as a kid, like even five or six years old, I would always go like pinch the fruit at the grocery store. Like I'd be like touching the peaches, touching the plums, whatever. And sometimes I'd knock them over. And my mom would smack me in the grocery store like, yo, stop pinching the fruit because I got to buy it if you bruise the fruit. And I see like white kids come in just like throwing fruit on the ground. Not throwing it, but like knocking it over. Parents didn't really care. And I remember I would see like Muslim families or black families, their kids would get smacked up too for bruising the fruit. And just as a kid, because you don't understand race at that time, I was just like, oh, I must be like them. Because mm. their parents don't want them bruising fruit and they get hit too. <laughs> Simple things like that when you're trying to figure out your identity as a kid. Mm. And then there's like a kinship. You know, like when you're the only Asian in school and then there's only one other black person, like, you're all right, we together. Yeah. We got to sit together. Man, we're, man. we're not like them. Yeah, man. we got to yeah. hold it down. And it was always that. And then Pac was huge for me. When Pac came out with Me Against the World, like my dad would walk around the crib with an AK. And when there was the interlude and she's like, look at you standing there all day with that fucking AK. Me and my brother were like, yo, that's like Pops. He's talking <laughs> about Pops. That's like mom complaining about dad all the time. And so... You know, Wait, why did your dad have an AK all the time? He he's just a Taiwan. He's a Taiwanese dude. He he was running around in Taiwan, and my uncle Shohei came for Christmas one year, gave it to him as a Christmas present. So he was just <laughs> rocking so it in the crib. Yeah, <laughs> so wild. But it was wild, super wild. But no, like on some on some real shit. The thing for me is is that I didn't see any Asian representation in the media, television, in the neighborhood. We were the only Asian family in that neighborhood, and so I started to just gravitate towards black culture and blackness because I was like, this is how I can understand being a minority in America. Mm. Black community is the one that's speaking out. They're creating a foundation. They're paving the way for us to understand race and identity for everyone, all immigrants. And hip hop was the anthem. I think for anyone that was an outcast, different, trying to understand their place and role in America, you listen to hip hop. See, it's interesting to hear you are because, you know, black people, we don't get to hear that. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, so we just assume people come to this country and they don't fuck with us. Yeah. Like, oh, they don't fuck with us. They don't fuck with us. They look down on us. They don't fuck with us. But it's interesting to hear that perspective, too. Yeah. Like, of, of people who are trying to find their path and are looking to people who have been here for a while to understand what's really happening. Yeah. It takes a couple generations because definitely, I'm not going to cover it up. You have grandparents and you have old Asian cats, you know, we'll call them gremlin keepers sometimes, <laughs> that are like... Yo, stay like stay away. Black people, they're dangerous. Don't go to the neighborhood. Like, just go sell the food in the neighborhood and go home and live wow, somewhere else. Nice. You know, and that's the previous generation. There definitely is like this fear of black people. But Chinese cats, Korean cats, like you know, they've we've gotten a lot of money serving the black community. And yeah. I think the second generation of kids like us, whose aunts and uncles and parents had Chinese fast food spots in the hood or did business we start to realize, yo, we're one in the same. Like, we need solidarity. There yeah. needs to be unity in the neighborhood because there are a lot of similar experiences. And I think what creates community is shared problems. That's like, right. we have shared problems. And what makes us individuals is the answers that we come up with. And so you got to do that work on your own. But, like, you got to remember, like, rally around the shared problems. You have so many, and you have so many twists and turns to your story. But one thing that I found super interesting is that you worked in the Innocence Project. Yeah, yeah, can you, yeah. Can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no. Barry Sheck, who was on the Dream Team for OJ, mm -hmm. he started the Innocence Project and using DNA testing to get cases reopened that for people that we believe were wrongfully convicted, right? And it's one of the most inspirational, fulfilling things I ever did in my life. You know, and and that experience there has driven a lot of our other work. You know, whether it's with the restaurant, whether it's interviews like this or writing, we really, our work is about social justice and and telling these stories that I think we need to shine a light on. The, the Brooklyn DA, are you following what Ken Thompson in Brooklyn has exonerated? I, I mean, he's been in office maybe a couple years now. I want to say he's exonerated five people who are wrongfully accused, have, who have been in prison probably upwards of like 25 years. Yeah. yeah. That he's going back and like digging into these cases. And that's happening. That's Brooklyn's isolated thing. But the Instance Project was nationwide. Yeah. You know, the thing is, when I was there, we, I remember two people got out. And one of them did 16 years or 17 years. And I met him. And 
he was he was an incredible man because he was just happy to be out and he was thankful to be out. But when you saw him trying to interact with cats and reintegrate into the world, it's not it wasn't like it just you could watch it and you were like, dude, this is a real uphill battle for him. Like his life has been taken away. Yeah. His life has been taken away and there's no way to give it back. And when you start to read the cases, like, man, I would throw shit around my room. I would kick things. I would break things. Because when you read these cases, people maliciously, they just needed to book somebody. They needed somebody well, to take the Well, when you say people, fall. you say the cops police. and police, yeah. prosecutors. Yeah. Yeah, when you got up close and personal with these cases and you started to see how evidence was manipulated or just bold-faced hidden, it... It turns your stomach, bro. And a lot of it, too, happens because, you know, in a, in a lot of places, people want an answer and they want it now. And yeah. the faster that the cops and the prosecutors can come up with this person is to blame yeah. and this person is who we're going to prosecute, the, the quicker the community calms of down course. and feels like there's a solution. Like yeah. And a lot on. of times they don't vet the case properly or they're just, like you say, rushing the judgment so that they can make everybody feel like work is being done. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and make themselves feel good about their, was it uh, crime rate numbers or conviction mm -hmm. rate yeah. numbers. And you guys, like you guys even freed some people that were on death row, right? Yes. And when I was there, I got testing for two people. Unfortunately, when I got them the testing, the, not just not me, I just did the research. You know, and I, I did the research and I was working things. And I worked for this attorney, Vanessa Potkin, who is a pit bull. Mm. I loved her. She did a lot of the work there. And she's an incredible woman. She's still there. But, um, we got DNA testing for two people. It didn't end up overturning their cases, unfortunately. But there were issues with the procedures, so the right thing was done. They got the DNA tested. But um, I'm sorry, you asked me a question. My bad. No, I was just saying, I was just talking about how they, uh, the prosecutors, everybody rushes to find a conviction. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I think the main thing with the criminal justice system, it's an adversarial system, which means the prosecutor wants to convict this guy. The defense attorney wants to, you know, ex uh, acquit this person. And they just fight and they battle. And a lot of times it becomes who's the better attorney, right? I think the system needs to really look at itself and one of the main things is instead of punitive punishment, needs to go to rehabilitative. Like, how can we rehab these cats and they can rejoin society? You know, it's not productive to put people in boxes. This doesn't do anything for us. Well, it's productive if you own stock on the uh, prison industrial complex. You exactly. get to build more jails. Exactly. And you get, to, you get to scare people into behaving a certain way so that they don't go to jail. And if they don't follow your rules, get in line and be on time and not try to think for themselves, then it works for those individuals who want that oppressive kind of society. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 very capitalist too. Capitalism built on competition. Through competition, the cream's supposed to rise to the top. But we see that don't, that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? And with the adversarial system, it's through arguing the truth. You're supposed to come to the truth through arguing. But it, you see all the time it doesn't happen. And you need to start to look at this system and be like, is the adversarial system working? I don't think so. And I also think that you have to have the rehabilitative punishment because people are making money. They're profiting. Yes. Politicians are profiting. The people owning these things are profiting off of crime and punishment. And so, in some regard, they probably want to keep it going. Yeah. And and guns go up missing. Yeah. And there's more illegal guns on the street, and we're wondering why. Yeah. They, it's, they, <laughs> the system, in a lot of ways, is broken, which is why this election cycle has been very funny to watch. You know? Are you happy about um, what you're seeing, you know, with uh, Hillary Trump? Do you like Bernie? Do you have an opinion? You know, I like them for different... I like Bernie, but then there's a part of Bernie when Bernie keeps talking about things. It's, oh, it's all economic. It's all economic. It's like it's not a racial thing. That does bother me because I'm like, Bernie, there is a lot of race involved in a lot of the economic things you're talking about. I do agree with Bernie, though, that the way to make people whole and the solutions are economic. Yeah. The solutions may be economic. The problems definitely involve race, you know? Um, I think Bernie's fly. I like the minimum wage going up to 15, even though I'm going to have to pay that at Bauhaus. You yeah. know, I'm down for it. Yeah. I, I believe people need to be making those wages. But he also needs to come up with ideas how to maintain competition and create more opportunities for cats like myself to be small business owners. You know, we don't all need to have five or six stores and have economies of scale, but like, let's incentivize people to own their businesses and help these small businesses absorb this higher minimum wage. And you have two restaurants. I got one. One. Bauhaus, just and on 14th it? Street. And that's right in the East Village. Yep. yep. And you've had that for how long? I've had it seven years in December. We opened December 2009. And, and you know, the thing with Bernie, the thing, 
big corporations can absorb this fifteen dollar minimum wage. He needs to find a way. How are the small businesses going to? So absorb for you, this? Right. for you recognizing that this minimum wage is going to come in a few years here in New York City and New York State, you already know that your profits are going to get eaten into by this, or do you raise prices? No, your profits are going to be eaten into. But I really feel like we need to look at the entire food system, right? What are the things that cost money in the food system? The pricing structures are all off. Like things, things do not cost what they should cost. Like it's more expensive to buy vegetables than ground meat at times, you know? And mm. a lot of the meat is like commodity meat with antibiotics and hormones and things like that. So, you know, it's not just a minimum wage that's a beginning, that's a starting point. But you have to look at the whole ecosystem. You buy a sandwich— there's so much involved in terms of unions and business and laws and subsidies for to all the ingredients sandwich, that are in a sandwich. sandwich. Yeah. And then you're talking about power and insurance and labor. Like, there's a lot goes into a sandwich. <laughs> Yo, sandwich talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, real yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Car carb talk. <laughs> Eddie Wang, uh, where can people come check you out? I know, um, is this Yeah, it? tonight, Tuesday, May 31st, 7 p.m., we're at Barnes & Noble, Union Square. And then Wednesday, June 1st, 7.30 p.m., we're at Bergen Beer Hall with my homegirl, Elena Bergeron. So that's so tonight tight. and then again, mm -hmm. uh, and again on Wednesday, tomorrow. tomorrow. Yep. Um, and your streetwear companies, your clothing companies, you still have those or those? No, we. I stopped. I got too busy, but I had Bergdorf Hoodman. Hoodman yeah. And then I had uh, Monica Monroe for a little bit. And it was fun. You know, we sold it at Harvey Nichols with Fly, but it just got too busy. And so now you're all about what? You're all about And he has his TV show too. Oh, yeah. I got Wong's World on Viceland mm -hmm. every yeah, Thursday that's right. at 10 that's right. p.m. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, travel around the world. How, and how, what's that experience like? It, that, it, that's incredible. It, that's one of the hardest things I've done and super fulfilling. Like we went to Jamaica and we're able to kind of tell the story of how the IMF and all these countries have been holding Jamaica down with this debt. Mm. And then we talked about all the cultural contributions and things Jamaicans have done and then their process and history of getting free and how it's manifested in food, right? Every story we tell from food, it starts with food and then we unpack it. Like we're saying how complicated the sandwich is. Everything you eat in this world, you can see the politics, you can see the history, and you see identity and culture. So we go to countries, Jamaica, Burgundy, France, Istanbul, the border towns in Mexico. We went to Juarez, um, Orlando, Orlando stand up. <laughs> <laughs> went to Sicily, China, Taiwan, and we're doing the same thing everywhere. If we see the people are being misrepresented or misunderstood in the mainstream American media, we go to that country and we tell their story from their mouths and we let them speak. And how long has this show been on? This is the Viceland just started a couple months ago. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just started. We are into episode six right now. So episode six is this Thursday, the Orlando episode with my family. 10 p.m. on Viceland, and then after that, we got Taiwan and the finale in China. And so you still rep Orlando, it sounds like. That's considered, I I, <laughs> or is it more of a D.C. I, thing for you? No, no, I rep New York. I really feel like I became a man in New York. You know, that that's where I became a man. I came here when I was summer, when I was 22, and uh, I've been here ever since. Split time the last two years in L.A. Orlando, Orlando was fun, but uh, I don't really... I mean, I have to claim Orlando. That's where I'm from. You yeah. know, formative years. So, of course, I rep Orlando, but I really feel like I'm a New Yorker. Been here the longest. All right, let's have rap talk. It's rap talk yeah, time. Yeah. What are you into right now? Future. <laughs> Facts. I stay riding for future. You like future. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm super loyal. And, like, I remember early 2000s, I was just banging G-Unit, Diplomats, Jeezy, Fab, Clips. And then, you know, I feel like there was a little lag for a minute, but mm -hmm. future came back... He's the first cat I felt in a while. That I'm like, yo, I want to go to the club just to listen to his record right okay. now. I need to be All in the right. club. But I, I fuck with Future. What's I like next? Skepta. Skepta's mm. I like the Skepta new album. Konnichiwa album, Konnichiwa Konnichiwa album yeah. is pop, man. Yeah, I so like the good. Skepta album. Um, what else? What else? Are you in the pro era? Joey Badass at all? Have you gotten Action to that? Joey's cool. Bronson. Joey's fam. Joey comes to the restaurant all the time. Okay. Action too. All Action right. is fam. Um, Danny Brown. I like Danny okay. Brown a lot. Um... Oh, Killer got that new song out with Jewels. Yeah, we're playing that right? at High Nine Seven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I that's I, in the Battle of the Beats right now with Megan Wright, I think. Yeah. So you're a big Dipset fan, like you huge still, number one Dipset Dips, fan. Dipset all day. put out new music right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all day. And then uh, yeah, Cam did the theme song for Wong's World. Yeah. And Danny did the theme song for Fresh Off the Boat. But um, who else? Let Do me, you like let me the ASAP Mob? Yeah. Rocky oh, Ferg. Ferg. Yeah. Ferg is the one. You like that? I love that yeah. Ferg album. I, I like right the now. Ferg album. Nice. Ferg comes hard. And Ferg is one of those cats. I feel like he's going to be around a long time because he knows who he is and he does it every time. Right. Like, 
it, it's like Jeezy and Fab, they, they, that was the same dude. Every single time, you know what you're getting. I ordered a hamburger, I'm getting a hamburger. You know? Yo, I said, I'd say the same shit, yeah. right? Don't sell me fucking spaghetti, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want to know If I come to I'm your getting. store, I want to know what you sell. And, yeah. and And make sure it's on the menu every time. Yeah, I ride for you. Like, come with it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you being somebody that loved 90s hip-hop and was kind of raised in it. Oh, I like Lil Yachty. I do like Lil you Yachty. You do? I nah, like Lil Yachty man. a little bit. <laughs> nah, I got to fuck, because that video you're is hype beast to me right now, Eddie. Come on, man. Don't hype beast Ooh, me, man. I kind of like it. So you like I it based on the visual? The visual is fly. Okay. The visual is but, but super if, fly. I, I like wet. I, I like I like net art. Like that internet net art shit. It's funny. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. But, I'm gonna go. Watch. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna say, man. I I don't get it, man. Yeah, Lil man, Uzi we should, Vert. We should have Lil him up Yachty, here and talk to him. We the, should have the him up project here. Project Lil Boat. Like yeah. I, I don't. I'm I'm trying to. <laughs> I don't know all that. I just seen the the one night video and I was like, flames. I fuck with that. So you did. You saw it on the blogs. Yeah, the blogs got you hyped. Yeah, no, my roommate played it on the TV. Got it. Because I don't really. I stay off the blogs. I'm not into the blogs. I just I wait for people to tell me about shit. Oh, right. the panda song, you know? Yeah, Gotta bang that panda. No panda? Even design. though, even though I'm the original human panda, but I let him hold it. <laughs> okay, but let, me, but let me ask you this. When you heard Designer for the first time, yeah. what'd you think? I thought it was Future. So you as a super Future fan, yeah, that doesn't bother you at all? It does bother me that he got a number one before Future got a number one, mm. right? But I love Panda. Like, the record's I mean, hard. Like, yeah, you can't. We bought the rights for, for the trailer. Like, when that song came out, I was like, put it in the trailer. Vice, we need to buy this up. Facts. So, like, yeah. Let's just get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Go say. to the store. Let me buy that panda. <laughs> <laughs> so, who else you like, man? Uh, Schoolboy Q. Of course. Oh, I fuck yeah. with Schoolboy Q. Kind of really with I like the Fat yeah. Joe was back. Yes. I always like Terror Squad. So, I'm feeling that Fat Joe was back. Um, who else I got on here? I feel like it's been a little bit light this year. Really? It's been a little bit light. Hmm. It's been a little bit. Oh, I like a Kodak Black. You really? I like Kodak Black. Yeah. You know, so you're not a Kendrick fan. You're not a Cole fan. I like. Uh, I'm not a Cole fan. Really? Not a Cole fan. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kendrick. Kendrick, I ride for. Okay. I ride for Kendrick. I really do. The first album, I think, is still his best album. Okay. But I'm really curious to see what he comes with next. He's a dude. You don't know what he's gonna serve you. Right, you don't know what he's coming with every time. Well, you know, lyrically, it's gonna be right. Yeah, you know that. Musically, it may change. Yeah. I think that's what we've learned so far. Lyrically, intellectually, he's gonna be right. The only thing with the second album was I felt like it was produced like by Tony Tony Tone. So yeah, it was, it was like too R and B for you. Acid jazzy. It wasn't my thing. It was definitely jazz and, funk and that kind of like West jazz. West Coast funk pimp thing. Yeah. It's not my vibe. But he's, I think, lyrically, he's number one. Undefeated. What about like, um? What about Drake? Uh, you a Drake fan? No. no not, not at all? Drake, not a Drake fan. Really? Not a Drake fan. What you know what? what I love, the, here's what, the thing with Drake. I love Drake on SNL. Future. I love... Oh, the album he did with Future was okay. fly, but I feel like Future carried that. <laughs> right? So you Future felt like those were Future that. records that featured Drake. Yeah, basically. I thought those were Future records. But uh, I love Drake on SNL. The the thing is, you when you watch at SNL, you start to wonder, like, is he acting like a rapper? Because he's a fantastic actor. <laughs> You know? I think that's what people's uh, and contra that's, or discrepancy, if you will. Yeah, like you know, th like the cats I mentioned, Jeezy, Fab, Cam. You listen, they're not acting. It's just like that's that dude. They can't help but be this guy, mm -hmm. and I like it. I feel like I know who I'm talking to. I know what I'm buying. Drake is you like you know he came out the album. You see the visuals. It's like yo, are you Persian now? Like you looking Persian, sounding Jamaican. I'm confused, <laughs> you know. And I'm just like, what's he gonna come back next? Yeah. Yeah. You look like his a Persian is... daddy. <laughs> yeah, why are you doing this? Oh, my bad. <laughs> no, not your bad. It's funny. It's funny. No, but I think what you're saying, a lot of people, that's the issue they have. Yeah. Is that Drake is, they're like, who are you, though? Yeah. Right? I think that's been the thing. Like, people will say, yo, Drake, I love when he goes bars. Like, his bars records yeah. are, are great. But then they'll say, but then he makes these pop records. I don't really want the, that from him. Yeah. And then he goes and he makes, like, now he has a, a re reggae vibes, right? And I think we, I think it's hard for people to digest Drake because we've never seen anything this diverse before. Yeah. But back to your point, is that because he's a great actor or is that because this is really who he is and making great music? I'll tell you this is like as as a as a person as a chef too it's like I feel like a lot of artists these days because of the internet they're like trying out material on us. You know? They're definitely on the internet. They're always trying out material and I feel like I'm seeing like Chris Rock at the cellar or another comedian before like the set is fully formed 
And well, it feels like you're listening to demo tapes a lot these yeah, days. Yeah, a lot of demo tapes. And I'm like, all right, it's cool. And, and a lot of restaurants now, like people are very self-indulgent and referential. And they're like, oh, I want you to be involved in my process. I'm kind of like, I don't want you seeing how the sausage is made. And also, I don't want to pay to watch you make the sausage, right? If you're at a restaurant, they always have these specials. And I taste it. I'm like, did you practice, fam? Because it doesn't, I feel like I just bought practice. Right. You know? And I wish there was more AIs. It's just like, fuck practice. Like, just watch the game. Watch the game and work hard. And I'm like, if you didn't practice it, you didn't finesse this and edit it, like, don't sell this to me. I shouldn't be paying for this. Facts. You know? And that's that's how I feel is that... Now, you know, do you feel like that because you're kind of of the 90s generation and that's, you know, like, I, I believe, and this is my own theory, I've made yeah. it in my own mind, that young people like to see the sausage made because they don't know how to tell what's real and what's not. Right. So because we've gotten so there is no like back in the 90s, you you knew who was in the street and you knew who was in the club. Right. Yeah. And you would either be a part of that experience or hear of that experience. Yeah. Now, because people hide behind avvies and computer screens and blog posts and all these things, you never see them. And they talk tough in all these places. Everybody yeah. talking tough in their songs. I think the consumers like I don't really I mean, you talk real tough, but you never been in trouble. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. understand. Like, yeah, you've been talking about shooting somebody for a minute, but I never seen you shoot anybody. Like, when does it happen? Yeah. And I made this own theory in my mind. Like, I think the X Games is just crazy. But you saw dudes literally jumping off buildings, like real life daredevils. But in the rap music, you would hear all this daredevil shit and never actually see it in real life. So the kids got to a point where they was like, yo, I want to know who's real and who's fake. Yeah, there's a lot of thespians. You know, yeah. there's a lot of thespians out there. And for me, the thing is, is that this generation, I feel like they, they think like the world owes them attention. You know what I mean? Like they'll tweet at you and I don't even know these cats. They'll tweet at you and feel like, they deserve a response. Mm. Tweet oh, you of five, course. six times. Oh, for sure. You know, some 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 people they find your phone number, that your email, whatever. They're hitting you every day, like you owe them attention. I feel like our generation was like, yo, nobody in the world owes me attention. I earn it. You earn respect. Respect is not given. So my thing is, I work hard on the work and I edit it and I make sure it is fire and I believe it and it's the best I can do before I put it out because I don't think anybody owes me their attention if I didn't respect myself in the work 100. Mm. His name's Eddie Wang. He's, here <laughs> He's kicking, awesome. Dropping gems, if you will. <laughs> just know. Keeping it 100. Just yeah. know. You might have heard of him. Fresh off the boat, Eddie Wang. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that that hat you have on, Base 5. Base 5, did yeah. You catch, did you catch any flack ever from other Asian Americans like fresh off the boat, like that was like a, calling somebody a fob? Because I know Filipino cats who call each other fobs, right? Yeah. Or Asian cats, you know, call each other fresh off the boat fob. Like it was like, so, oh, he's mad fob. Like he acts fresh off the boat or he's fresh from the from yeah. the country. But that's not something like I could say. Just it's kind of like the N-word is not yeah, something yeah, everybody yeah. No, can just definitely. throw around. Definitely. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, I never caught flack for it. You know, there's a couple people on the internet I don't know. No one's, I always say this, no one said it to my face. No one's mm. had a problem to my face. And between me and, and all my friends and people in the community that I know, it's like, it's a sense of pride we're reclaiming it. Just like, you know, a lot of other racial epithets and words, people have their relationship to it and they claim it. But like, I respect the fobs. Like, I ride mm. for the fob. My parents, you know, I go back every year. I go back to Taiwan or China, you know, because it's part of who I am and I got to keep that connection. You know, mm. that's big for me. And I, I almost thought I would catch flack from Lil B, but Lil B actually nah, he's hit the, me. He's, he's the away. man. Yeah, you don't want him cursing you. I love him. He's the one. You if know what? If he blessed you, you're good. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. He hit me and was like, yo, oh, we all blessed. in this. Yeah, Base fobs <laughs> right out. He blessed it. But like, he's the one, he's the one rapper I feel like is the godfather to a lot of these young rappers that are out now. Oh, yeah. And well, it's a combo. We was having this family tree combo. Yeah. Combo of the influence of Gucci, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? The influence of, of Lil B. Yup. And, and those are kind of like, and then you see these kind of uh, young kids coming up now are kind of a morph of that yeah. kind of thing all yeah. put into one. They're the most innovative ones, like Gucci with the mumble rap, mm -hmm. you know, and Lil B with like blurring the gender lines and like I'm a pretty bitch and all mm -hmm. this. And like these cats are straight taking his math. You know what I mean? And I feel like B needs to come out and just smash a lot of people out of the game. That's the like thing. Like put out an album. For put real. out an album. And he's one that Didn't he like, put out like a 90 song mixtape one time or something crazy? It was way too much music for me to sort through. Yeah, conceptually, and I didn't get it all. he's the most interesting and I think creative, but like he's one I want to see. Edit it down, give me your 10 best tracks and just smash everybody out the game.
Eddie Wang, man, give it up for him yeah. right now. Thank you.